Good evening and welcome to the uh, NOC World Ocean Day celebration. I'd like to introduce Professor Christine Gommeninger, um, who is going to uh, chair this session and will be covering the topic of oceans from space. Welcome, Christine. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, and uh, welcome to this uh, session on oceans from space. I'm uh, Christine Gommeninger uh, from the National Oceanography Center. And uh, today we have this uh, short session to give you a flavor of how we use uh, satellites to uh, study the oceans. Um, in this session, we am going to be joined by uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Clive Neal, who is gonna wave at the screen now. There we go, Clive. And Sophie Durston, who is gonna wave now. There we go. And they're going to join me towards the, the sort of halfway through this session to have a bit of a conversation around what it's like to, to work and do research in the satellite oceanography. So I'm going to uh, make a start. And the way we um, going to uh, run this session is uh, as follows. So I am going to give a, a short overview of some of the uh, basic uh, tools that we have to observe uh, the oceans uh, with satellites. And in about 10, 15 minutes time, we'll move into this conversation with Clive and Sophie to talk a little bit more, to great, a little bit more detail about the projects that they are working on. And then there'll be time for some questions. So if you have questions or about anything you hear or, or anything else, please submit them in the chat or you can also uh, submit them in the speakers lounge. Um, and in fact, uh, I will be available uh, to answer any other questions in the speakers lounge after the end of this session uh, until about half past seven. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, start on this uh, short introduction to uh, satellite oceanography, measuring the oceans from space. So at the moment, uh, as you have probably heard a lot in the news lately about how many satellites there are and the fact that the Earth is surrounded by, um, by objects orbiting the Earth. And this is a kind of a, a snapshot of all the items that are uh, orbiting, orbiting the Earth. Uh, of, as of January 2021, there were about three and a half thousand active satellites uh, actually doing something uh, out of about 7,000 in total. So you can see that half of them are uh, basically inactive or, um, you know, and in addition to this is also an awful lot of junk, you know, bits of satellites are broken off and et cetera, et cetera. So of, of all those three and a half thousand active satellites, about just under 300 are actually used to pointing at the earth to actually observe the environment or to observe the, the, the ocean, uh, the ocean, the atmosphere and, and other things. And I'm talking here simply of uh, civilian and publicly owned satellites. There's obviously a lot of satellites that uh, people who do research do not have access to, which we are not going to consider here. And around those, uh, in those 300 or so satellites, there are about 40 that are directly relevant to what we do uh, to observe the, uh, the oceans and, and the atmosphere in, in particular. And you'll hear me use the word EO, and that stands for Earth Observation, which is a, a general term for uh, those satellites that are used to monitor the, uh, the, uh, the Earth's environment. So the uh, satellites that we use for oceanography come in all sorts of sizes. This is a, a picture of probably the largest uh, ocean uh, or satellite that we, we've ever had. That was Envisat. That was, uh, as you can see, uh, is absolutely massive. I mean, this is, this is a, a person, uh, not a small person. This is an ordinary, probably quite a tall person. In fact, as you can see, the satellite itself is absolutely enormous. It was larger than the double-decker bus, basically. And it had a huge number of, uh, of instruments on, on board, as you, as you can see from all the antennas and all the different bits of, of instruments that you can see on there. 
More recently, we've had uh, a move towards smaller satellites. So we tend to go for more smaller satellites. So this is an example of something uh, of a satellite uh, from the UK called TechDemosat-1, about the size of a washing machine, if you like, you know, sort of 100 kilogram kind of, um, uh, kind of class. Uh, where you can do uh, a lot of stuff with, with that sort of uh, size satellite as well. Uh, another example of a uh, satellite we worked with is the Cygnus uh, constellation. So that's a, a mission that was launched by NASA uh, a few years ago. As you can see from, from the photo, um, it, th these are now uh, so small that you can you can hold them uh, like that. So uh, and and we can launch those in in great numbers uh, to be able to do all sorts of things and observe the the atmosphere in particular uh, much more frequently. And then here the the trend really is towards smaller and smaller. And you may have heard of the term CubeSats, where literally we are launching satellites that are just a cube, you know, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. And here, if you can spot it, that is actually the satellite that these guys have been working on in this particular case to observe the cryosphere. So as you can see, large to very, very small uh, satellites, and all these are doing different things and measuring different types of uh, properties of the environment. So what sort of sensors do we use uh, for uh, ocean, uh, ocean monitoring from space? Well, it's basically, this is the electromagnetic spectrum and the bands, uh, so, so, so the, the, the X axis, if you like, the, the line on the bottom goes from very short waves uh, on, on the left hand side to longer waves of the order, as you can see, goes all the way to kilometers and longer. And the bands that we are using really are in the visible. So that's the visible light that we can all uh, we can see. And then infrared and microwaves, which you can see a slightly longer wavelength. And the, the brown outline actually shows you how transparent the atmosphere is in all these different uh, frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. And obviously, you want to work in areas where the atmosphere is not, it is transparent, where it's not opaque, so that we can see from space uh, all the way to the ocean and, and, and below the surface as well. So this is uh, visible is the one that we are probably most uh, familiar with. This is the, pic the very beautiful pictures we see of the ocean with phytoplankton blooms and, and so on. And I'll show you a few examples of this in a minute. Infrared can measure sea surface temperature very, very accurately. It's very, very important parameter for uh, particularly for climate studies. And then microwaves. So these are particularly uh, useful uh, observations because they can see through uh, the atmosphere and they also work. They don't rely on the availability of sunlight to measure a whole host of, uh, of uh, parameters which are very important for the ocean, like sea level, winds, currents, salinity, waves, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many applications. If you want to know a bit more about uh, satellite oceanography, there's uh, some uh, uh, information, some resources online. These slides will be available uh, after, after this session anyway, so you can go and take a look at this. And there's also uh, um, an online course that you can sign up to if you, if you are interested. Uh, on, on the lighter side, if you want to know how, uh, why, how these data are used uh, for to answer real questions, I would invite you also to have a look at the NASA website that has lots and lots of resources, a very entertaining way of illustrating the importance of looking into these problems and, and how satellites are contributing to, to understanding how, how the world works. So this is um, just a few examples now. Um, as I promised, a nice picture uh, from satellite of, of ocean color uh, in the visible. So you can, you may have seen some of these pictures before. This is a real picture. It's not an illustration. And particularly, this is this is from a from a American satellite uh, called Modis, Aqua Modis, um, and you can see these uh, these really really sort of beautiful colors there in in the ocean. This is another picture from another satellite, Sentinel-2, which is flying at the moment. Um, and what we can see is those incredible patterns of, uh, of phytoplankton blooms, essentially, in, in the ocean. So they're highlighting there, 
and also there. Now you'll see that the, the two images have got very different scales. You know, on the left, the, the scale is thousands of kilometer wide uh, with resolution of something like one kilometer. That's the smallest kind of uh, size of the pixel that you have in that image. And on the, on the right hand side, Sentinel-2, the scales are really, really small. And we go down to, to um, seeing things of the order of a few tens of meters now. And you can see this incredible detail of how the uh, phytoplankton is following fronds and, and you know, how, how the water is mixing both horizontally and vertically. And this is very, very important to understand particular how the ocean is taking up things like CO2 and, and so on and taking carbon uh, into the ocean. You can see also on the figure on the left a uh, different sort of color, sort of this sort of brownish uh, color that you see near estuaries and so on. And that is really a signature of suspended sediments and all sorts of other things that are uh, suspended in the water, which is also very useful. Uh, the satellites also very useful to, to monitor this sort of uh, water quality and so on. And really this is how this is used. These, these type of observations are used uh, to, to look at water quality and uh, ecosystem health. It is affected by clouds, that's a problem with visible light. So uh, when it's cloudy, it doesn't work so well. And that's why we are interested also in other techniques such as here, uh, microwave radar images. And I'll give you just uh, one example here of a, an image taken over, uh, the, uh, over the Bangladesh, the Ganges Delta, uh, really at the coastal, uh, in those coastal regions, there's a lot of, you can see very clearly the difference between the land and the water. And one of the things that we're discussing or we're working on here, and this is something that Clive will tell us a bit more about in a moment, uh, is how we use these images to detect the position of the coastlines, which are very, very changeable in, in these regions, very dynamic. Okay, another example, now that we have so many satellites and, and particular series of satellites, as you can see here, this is a series of satellites that have all measured salinity uh, all the way since 2009 uh, up to today. And we can build these kind of movies that show how salinity, which is how much salt there is in, in the water, changes really quite quickly. Um, and, and this is the first time we've actually been able to see just how dynamic the salinity of the ocean changes. This is the salinity at the surface. And you can see some amazing things like, you know, of course, the Mediterranean is, is hot and salty. So that's very nice for, for holidays and, and, and so on. But, but you can see the rivers. So the Amazon plume, for example, is vague, may clearly seen there where the freshwater, the, the blue lower salinity uh, freshwater uh, per, per penetrates all the way across the, uh, the Atlantic here. Yeah. So it allows us to, to look at uh, big changes in the environment, you know, to do link to, to, to essentially changes in freshwater cycle. And it was very, very useful to, to look at how the, the, um, the earth is evolving. Finally, uh, something that's really important is how this satellite data is now used for sustainable development. And we're working extensively with countries across the world, really to try to find new applications of these data to help uh, people manage uh, the marine and coastal regions sustainably. So there are some examples there where, again, using sequences of images, you can look at changes, particularly in coastal regions. Again, there's some resources online here, uh, uh, a webinar by one of our colleagues, uh, Stephen Carpenter, on how do you uh, map the uh, shallow water environment in the coastal zone using satellites. And then last but not least, this is uh, the uh, PhD project that Sophie will be talking to us about in a moment on the sargassum, which is this uh, dark, this brown algae that you can see here in that image, which uh, has a habit of accumulating in the Caribbean islands in those beautiful uh, beaches, uh, impacting those uh, communities very, very seriously indeed. So that's, um, that's it for my little tour of uh, introduction of uh, some of the things we do with satellites to, to uh, understand how the ocean works. And at this stage, I am going to um, um, start this uh, conversation with, uh, with, first with Clive and then with, uh, with, with Sophie about, um, about, uh, about, what, about, about their work.
So in the meantime, if you think of questions and so on, please remember to put your questions in the chat and also in the uh, speakers lounge uh, for, for later on. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can all see each other properly. There we go. And I can see who's here as well, which is good. Um, sorry. Need to get out of that set. There we go. And so, sorry, <laughs> just finding my way around my, my screen. Um, all right, so um, we'll start with, with, with Clive. Hi, Clive. Um, you, I think you're muted at the moment. Uh, no, I, I think I, I believe I'm unmuted, Christine. All right. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Are you ready for a little introduction when uh, you you give me the go ahead? Okay, fine. So, Clive, yes, thanks for uh, accepting to participate in this. Um, so, would you like to to start by uh, telling us, you know, who you are and what are you working on uh, at NOC? Certainly. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to your session, Christine. I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, my name is Clive Neal. Um, I'm a research scientist in satellite oceanography. Um, I joined NOC in October 2018, and I'm a coastal satellite expert. Um, previously, I have worked in IT as a consultant where I used to build very large corporate websites in intranets. But I found that very dry and a little bit dull because I'm really a scientist by background and by nature. Um, and I find research so much more exciting, stimulating and interesting. So I actually retrained by taking a master's degree at Southampton University. And I was lucky enough to apply for and be given a job at NOC. Um, I primarily work with radar data, which is a microwave band we've seen. The image from Bangladesh was one of my images, and that's from a European Space Agency satellite, which is known as Sentinel-1. Um, it's an imaging satellite. Um, uh, my main role is to extract information on the exact coastline position, as well as mapping other features, such as potentially sandbars, beaches, where they change after storm events or other um, large events and I also map into tidal zones and possibly some estuaries even if they're not strictly the ocean it's like the boundary between the ocean and land is what I'm interested in. Um, since I've joined NOC I've been lucky enough to work on various projects and I've analysed data from Africa, from the Caribbean and several major river deltas globally including the Indus and Pakistan the Ganges in Bangladesh, which we saw briefly, and also the Irrawaddy Delta in Myanmar. Um, now I'm focused on looking at data from the UK, where I'm supporting the Environment Agency and other local authorities to try and allow them to work more efficiently and spend their okay. money wisely. Thank you. That's very, very, uh... Sounds very busy. <laughs> so, so why are you particularly interested in using satellites to do this work? Well, as you showed us in your introduction, there's a lot of global satellites. Um, many of them are available to the public. I actually download data which is freely available. Um, a lot of these satellites give regular and very high quality observations. The satellite I use has a, a repeat rate of about a week. So in every coastal zone globally, you get an image about once a week, which can be important to look at change. Um, the resolution of the satellite on the ground that I use is typically between six and nine meters, and that depends on your exact latitude. Um, but what's important is that satellites can get images where direct measurements may be difficult. It might be too expensive in areas that are in inaccessible. Um, areas might be dangerous, either from a geography point of view, you know, with moving sediment and moving currents or politically unstable. So we can use satellites to get repeat accurate measurements globally, which is which is fairly, you know, what a thing that satellites are unique in. Um, and in some of the coastal zones, including the Ganges River Delta, there's very fast currents. So sediment moves very rapidly. Um, um, 
and it would be difficult and dangerous to survey because you know it'd be difficult to access it by boat and also with the rapid changes using satellites we can get repeat measurements very very quickly so that's another important aspect yeah it's obviously very uh, very relevant uh, work as well because you know there's so many people obviously working uh, living in in those environments uh, so it's it's very relevant so so what what attracted you uh, in um, with to, to working with uh, satellite oceanography in the first well, place as, as I mentioned, I've got a background in computing. I started out with an undergraduate degree in physics. So I'm, as I was saying, I'm kind of a scientist by nature, if you like. Um, and I'm interested in big data. For example, the data set that I'm, um, that I'm using for the UK is something in the order of, at the moment, I think it's about five terabytes or something. Um, so I enjoy the challenges presented by that. Um, um and i i enjoy using computer methods to to find new areas of research and to determine how oceans work and how they interact with land um the satellites can give us information about a lot of different uh, physical parameters from the earth um and i'm enjoying using new technologies for example i hope to be able to use machine learning in the near future to find new relationships between uh, uh, different parts of the Earth climate system, and as well as improving the image processing um, algorithms that I've been developing whilst I'm at NOC. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot of, to be done there because really so far, you know, Earth's observation, we have a lot of people who work on the waters, on the wet side, the waterfront, and then a lot of people look at the land, um, but it's really only now that we can look at all those things together and see how what's happening on land affects the ocean and and vice versa as well. Um, yeah, absolutely, and I mean I haven't got a background in oceanography, but I find it absolutely fascinating to work with other scientists on various different projects and extended teams to increase. You know, and I bring the computer skills, and other people bring the modelling skills. So I enjoy very much the interaction between all the different uh, teams that I work with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Clive. And, you know, good luck with the rest of your research. That's, uh, that, that's great. But don't, don't leave us. Stay with us. No, no, no. I'm not going we anywhere. might get lots of questions on. about your work. So uh, stay with us. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, let's, uh, let's move over to, uh, to, to Sophie. So, Sophie, you're, you're in your first year of your PhD uh, here at the NOC um, with the University of Leeds as well. So can you tell us about uh, what, what are you studying for your PhD? So yeah, I'm Sophie. Um, so I'm currently working on the problem of sargassum in the Caribbean. So sargassum is, as we see um, saw earlier in your slides, sort of a large brown seaweed that forms these dense mats. And ever since 2011, um, there've been sort of examples of sargassum washing up on these Caribbean islands. So it's a very real problem for both the local people and the environment so the main the, mo the main discussed problem has been tourism then you've also got the impacts of the marine ecosystems and to the fisheries as well yeah indeed i mean that photograph really illustrated the problem of uh, those beautiful sandy beaches which obviously are waiting for for tourists uh, are, are completely uh, obliterated by these masses of of, of algae um, so, um, so how do you use the, the satellites uh, and, and, and what do you hope to learn from it during your PhD? So the sargassum itself can sort of aggregate into these very large mats. So it even can span the Atlantic. So they can be seen using optical imagery. So from your slides earlier, using the sort of visible, um, visible light. And um, you can, it shows up as very red compared to the blue water behind it. So it can be seen in lovely optical images and these satellite images can tell us where the sargassum is, it can tell us where it's going, what size, um, and just shows a lovely distribution of it. And from this, we can sort of find out where it's going, where it's going to go. So we've got two main areas for the sargassum, which is in the Caribbean Sea, but also in the Atlantic. And the challenge now is to find out how these two sort of relate. And the sort of main question I want to find out from this PhD is, um, 
exactly what's happening from year to year. So the sargassum itself differs every year. So it differs in where it is, the size, and how much actually washes up in the Caribbean. And sort of using these satellite data images, as well as some sort of computer models, we'll hope to find out what sort of environmental, environmental variables um, have the largest role in all this um, year to year variability. Yeah. Okay. So it's about knowing what's causing them and, and what makes them end up on those beaches, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. So, so how, how much do we know about this at the moment? I mean, it's, uh, well, can you tell us a little bit more about what are the, 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 the main things that might be affecting where it ends up? So there's mainly sort of speculation, depending on where, where it is in the sort of ocean. It's in the Atlantic and you've got the um, Amazon River, which will be a main source of nutrients, um, as well as just the main circulation currents as well. That seems to affect it a lot. And there could be some coastal upwelling on the, on the west coast of Africa. Um, all these play a sort of large part in it, as well as um, wind, the waves, um, sea surface temperatures. So there's quite a large amount of variables that all can be really measured using satellite data, which um, means you can get sort of a large data set and compare it all in one big go, um, which is quite exciting. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully to try and predict then where the sargassum is going to go, where how much is going to beach to try and provide some sort of strategy for these yeah. uh, for the Caribbean islands. Yeah. yeah. So, so what attracted you to, to doing a PhD in satellite oceanography? So firstly, I think it's such a sort of fast growing field at the minute. You've got so much satellite data that's already available to use straight away, but it's also sort of growing sort of day by day. And this sort of satellite data can be used for sort of so many different things. Although I'm focusing on Sargassum now, the sort of skills and kind of um, satellite products I'll be using could be transferred to any environmental problem that could arise from you know climate change or just is already out there that needs solving i can sort of transfer the skills to anything so after the phd it means sort of i've got all the prospects open if i manage to sort, sort of tackle the sargassum i might be still working on that you might get a job in the caribbean island who knows you know <laughs> managing the sargassum <laughs> that'd be lovely that'd be lovely i know these this photographs are always very attractive except for the sargassum of course yeah, very good. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Sophie. That sounds great. And again, uh, you know, good luck with with your with your work as well. I uh, hope it, it all goes well. Um, time is getting on, so I'm afraid we're going to uh, move over now to trying to answer questions. I don't know if there are any questions uh, for us in the chat or anywhere else. Uh, I can't see anything in the chat at the moment. Uh, I can say, see Ian is on line. Hi, Chris. Hi Christine. We've, yeah. we've got one question that we're asking all of our panellists over the day, and that's what inspired each of you to become an oceanographer? Wow, who wants to? Okay. Um, well, I can start because um, I, I'm old enough that when I was a student, uh, it was at the time of um, Cousteau. So I, um, I am from France. And at the time, Jacques-Yves Cousteau was doing all these movies, uh, documentaries about the oceans. And they were starting to learn about uh, oceans and how the ocean works and, and so on. It was really the early days of, uh, of this kind of documentaries, a bit like Blue Planet now uh, uh, these days. Um, and I just got absolutely fascinated by, by oceanography and then by satellite oceanography in particular, because again, we had this uh, other really, really inspiring uh, lecturer at the university who just, you know, basically just showed us the, 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 the potential of all the things that you can do with satellites. And for me, that was love at first sight and I just never turned back really. You know, I decided to do a PhD on it, and uh, and I stayed in that field. I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to to make a career of it. Um, I don't know if anyone else, Clive or uh, Sophie, do you um, want? Yeah, to I, I mean, I came from a kind of different background to that. I was 
I've always been interested in science since I was at school. And as I said, I did an undergraduate in physics and I had, did actually work in uh, hydrocarbon exploration as a geophysicist many years ago. Um, but I'm also really fascinated by technology and, you know, computers, coding, and it's come together for me. Also, for, for me, oceans are very important because they obviously cover a lot of the globe. They're not very well understood or and understudied. And also they have such a large effect on global populations. So I think my main motivation is I just want to try and make a difference to vulnerable populations and anyone who lives near the ocean. And it fits my skill set. And I love the, the, my role as a research scientist. So um, I'm absolutely in my element. And, and I'm picking up oceanography from other people I work with, which I find fascinating. Thank you. Sophie, did you want to add anything? Why, why did you want to become an oceanographer? Because you did oceanography before, right? Yeah, so I did my undergrad degree in sort of, um, it was marine, like ocean sciences. So I think I started off wanting to do marine biology from an early age. And then I realized every time I was sort of reading or learning about it, I realized I didn't like the little, like learning about the fish or anything like that. I realized I kept asking questions about the big picture, like, oh, well, why do they live here? Why did what these processes that affect them? And I realized I kept learning about the habitats and the actual ocean rather than the fish and how sometimes that can, for, even for a conservation point of view, that can even be more important of learning about where these animals live. So then I ended up on the route towards oceanography and yeah, yeah. loving it. Yeah, it's a very diverse field, uh, this uh, oceanography, you know, can do a bit of everything is biology, there's computer science, there's mathematics, there's engineering, it's, uh, it's very diverse and it's never, never boring, let's just say. It's very, very, uh, very, in, you know, very uh, interesting because it's so, so varied. Um, I see we have a question from, uh, from Mesh uh, in the chat. Uh, how do you measure sea level from EO satellites or is it surface level? Uh, or by Paul. Uh, so it is sea level, or some people also call it sea surface height, but uh, sea level is when you talk about it in the sort of climate, climate sort of context. Um, uh, sea level is measured by measuring essentially the distance between the satellite and the surface of the ocean. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's using a, 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 a microwave radar that sends a very, very sharp pulse, very short pulse, and then it measures very, very accurately how long it takes to go from the satellite to the surface and back. Um, and we, we do this with amazing accuracy these days. You know, those satellites are at altitudes of, you know, uh, 700,000 kilometer altitude. And we're measuring the, uh, the, the, the sea level with a, a, an accuracy of a couple of centimeters. So it's, it's an incredibly advanced uh, technology. Um, We've come a long way. It's something that been, we've been doing for, for a long time now. And uh, it's, um, it's really important, obviously, for the sea level uh, because of what's happening to sea level at the moment, uh, but also because it tells us about how the ocean is moving. So the, the, the sea surface height itself or the sea level, the differences in it relate to how the ocean currents are moving around the world. And that's one of our main sources of information about the, the global ocean circulation. So it's a very, very important uh, part of the oceanographic uh, sort of toolkit, if you like, to understand the ocean. I hope that answered the question. I can't see any more. 10 minutes to go. <laughs> so Christy uh, and the panel, the other question we're really interested in is if you could travel back in time, and give a 15 year old um, of yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? Wow, 15 me oh wow. Goodness, I don't know. Can I go first? I've, I've got something. Oh, um, go on then. <laughs> I, I, might try. Um, I think it's really important to get involved in what you enjoy. It's like, do, I mean, you know, you're, everyone's good at something, everyone enjoys something, and if you can make a career out of that, so much the better. And I think I think most people can. So yeah, I think going back in time, follow your heart and do what you enjoy, and then you can succeed in almost any field. 
That that's very true, Clive. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know so many people in this um, this field who say they've never done a day's work in their life because their job is just is their passion, and it feels like you're not um, you're not working. Basically, of course you are working. You're working very hard, but uh, it doesn't feel like it when it's something you you're passionate about. <laughs> Such great advice, Clive. Indeed. I mean, I, mean, I don't. <laughs> That doesn't have to be science, you know. Everyone's good at some. Everyone's good at something different. But I do think if you can find a niche that you enjoy, it just makes. I mean, yes, like Christine says, it is work, but it's a joy, you know. I really enjoy it, so um, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't feel hard hard to get up in the morning and you you know switch on the laptop again. In fact, my laptop's mostly grinding data out all night long anyway. <laughs> I, I wake up in the morning and see what the results are. That's right. It's a real privilege to to work in research. I think because you are, you know, it's yeah, the mind is is this is curiosity driven. You know, and you don't know where your work is going to take you, and so it's full of surprises. And you know, when you suddenly discover something that nobody else has has done before, it's just absolutely amazing, amazing feeling. Uh, yeah, please do research. Come into oceanography. <laughs> it's great. Question for Clive. Oh, see, it's Clive. Has the <laughs> proliferation of satellites and data giving us now that we could not do previously in the UK, such as monitoring shifting sands in Morecambe Bay? Paul again. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have been looking at Morecambe Bay. Morecambe Bay is a very large interactive area. Um, if you were if you had a boat and you could do a, a, a survey or possibly even with a li LIDAR flown by an aeroplane, which is another alternative, you could get a very good snapshot on how how the sands and the estuaries um, and how Morgan Bay was working. But then you'd have a problem that two weeks later or a month later, it would it would look different. So satellites allow us to monitor the change constantly. We're not in physical danger going out in boats. We don't have the expense of LIDAR surveys. So we can rapidly monitor change and also map what is actually a very difficult environment. And I think Christine showed earlier with, with her picture of the satellite, the radar image from the Ganges Delta, I think it's about 250 kilometers wide. So yep. these snapshots are really big and uh, uh, um, and in fact, in the UK, there's images almost every other day. So we, we've got a plethora of data and it, we've now got computers that are capable of analyzing these large data sets. So yes, um, uh, we, satellites are really, really good at monitoring change in, in complex and ch uh, rapidly changing environments such as Morgan Bay. I think it's fair to say that we have now so much data that uh, we haven't got enough people to look at all the data we have. And that is, you know, one of the amazing things about this field, just how rich in opportunities it is in terms of applications, you know, be it for to help monitor the, the environment or, or, or even, you know, commercial applications. Some people are, are also developing using these data. Uh, it, it really is a uh, very, uh, really impressive. Um, I would say that perhaps in the UK, even though we do have this great, great resource uh, in terms of satellite images, it's not necessarily used particularly well because it, there isn't always the awareness of what can be done with these images. Uh, in, in many respects, um, uh, countries in the developing world are much more attuned to the capability simply because they have no alternatives because the the alternatives to monitor those large areas like you know Indonesia for example have got huge environment to monitor and they're relying on satellites much more than than the UK is for example to 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 monitor their their, their very large domain. Clive you're, you're so popular you have another yes, question. Somebody's come in they're saying about local government yes we're working with an agency known as the Channel Coastal Observatory which isn't just a channel coast, it's, a, it's around the UK. Um, so that means the local, uh, local environment agency and local government agencies. 
Um, I don't really know. Christine knows more about me than central government policy. But I think what 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 we're looking at is is too fine a detail for the central government. They they might have their own projects and they might have banks of civil servants somewhere processing bits of data. I mean, there's a hydrology office as well. There's the ordnance survey. There's a British geological survey. So there's other people and other agencies looking at similar data sets to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't actually know how what is used, but if, if anybody is uh, interested, certainly uh, we're always uh, very interested in uh, in talking to to people who you know decision makers um, who, who need information to to guide their, their their decisions. Yeah, I mean, what I'm looking at is you know there's vulnerable bits of the coast. You see um, sometimes on the BBC headlines people's back gardens or even their whole house falling into the sea of Norfolk in East Anglia. And the Environment Agency has only got so much money for protective measures. And so if my focus at the moment is to allow them to better focus their effort into areas where it makes more sense to spend money and maybe and do less work in other areas. And, and satellites are really good at, at providing that kind of information. Oh, okay. Oh. I'm just looking at the speaker's lounge to see if there's anything there. Uh, uh, <laughs> so there's a question here um, from the previous panel. Um, this, uh, Angela asked her group earlier. So it goes, with the discussion of climate change, plastics and sea level rise, populations and habitats, but balanced against the future opportunities for us in the way we interact with the ocean, are you optimistic about the future? Um, I'm always, I'm an op, um, I am optimistic uh, that this is, uh, these, these are man-made problems and man-made problems are always solvable. Um, it is a matter of will. It's not, it, this is not something that is inevitable. This is something that we can do something about. It's whether or not uh, we, uh, you know, we have the, the will to, to make those changes, but we know what we need to do. Um, and it's a matter of just making it happen. Um, so I am optimistic that mankind will find a way to ensure its survival. Um, but let's just say the clock is ticking. So uh, we need we need action very, very soon, I think. Um, any other reactions? I, I'll second that. I'm also optimistic. I think humans are incredibly ingenious and when up against it thankfully the generations have all woken up to the problem and it's openly discussed and nobody can pretend it doesn't exist anymore which even 10 years ago you know was was different to as it, how it how it feels to me now yeah. um, that's right and i'm really one of the thing that really makes me very optimistic is the awareness of these issues uh with young people you know, the younger generation has so much more clued up than I was at my at their age. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I mean, Sophie may want to intervene. She's she's part of that younger generation, but uh, there's such great awareness of, of these issues and the importance of it. Uh, and that that does fill me with uh, with great optimism that that things are going to change. I hope so. I'd probably say it's probably like knowledge is power, I think. And I think these days you've got sort of information at your fingertips and I think maybe the younger generation has just been able to read and ingest more you know information all these science papers and the fact that everything's become, becoming more open source so I think everyone is freely available to see any data now and I think that's sort of changing mindsets I think that they can actually see what's happening rather than just getting told through someone else's words in newspapers and things is they can see the data for themselves okay yeah, very good. Thank you very much. I think, wow. I, think I was, I was going to say, what a, what a great session. We've had lots of good questions and lots of uh, interesting interactions here. Um, I would now perhaps suggest that we move across to the speakers lounge, um, which yeah. we can do on the platform link. And I know Christine is going to be available as our, our other panelists. And if you have any more questions, please post them on. But uh, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for the um, panel for their participation. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.